Okay, so do we have this? Oh, the system is working. Yes, you're, you're working. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Stephen, for those, those, those very kind words. Um, uh, Stephen uh, was on our oversight board, and it was always good to uh, uh, see the friendly and encouraging, but um, astute face at the table when we were being uh, uh, gently interrogated as to how we spent the last six months. Um, so, as, uh, as, as you've heard, my, my name is John, I'm director of the Adventures Platform UK, and I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you about brain health in an age of platform science. Uh, the, the goal really is to stimulate your, your grey cells, if that's okay. Uh, and I'm, I know that you've already had a very stimulating afternoon, but I want to stimulate it a bit further because uh, the idea of doing collaborative science is to be ambitious in order to answer questions that you would not otherwise be able to answer. And I'm really putting that forward to you as, as a direct challenge so you know exactly where I'm going. Um, I'm going to, effectively the talk's going to be in three parts. I, I'm going to be talking about the, the nature of the scientific landscape that, that we, we face. I'm going to be talking about a, a way forward in terms of cohorts. And then I'm going to talk about the Dementia's platform specifically. And according to the clock down here, I have about, uh, well, just a few minutes, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just press on. And the reason why I've called it brain health is because uh, the sorts of collaboratives and the sorts of infrastructures that we're talking about in the Dementia's platform, obviously, are not limited just to dementia. Once you have the, the platform established, uh, you can multi multitask it, multipurpose it for different outcomes and for uh, different uses. So let's just move on um, very quickly. Uh, we, we face a very, very important scientific challenge. Um, uh, things are always moving, but actually they're moving very fast, and the direction of travel is, is very predictable. Uh, the low-hanging fruit has gone, so the next generation of science will involve asking questions of greater complexity. It will involve increasing downward cost pressures on our budgets. And it will involve engaging more closely with the social capital, the populations, the stakeholders, the scientists uh, that, that are around us. And th these are trends which are going to happen. Uh, and they're happening already. And any, any discipline which does not respond to these trends will not flourish. Okay, so let's just look at the greater complexity. We'll be looking at, we have to address questions which are far more focused. <coughs> it's no good having, oh, this very broad, very vague question. Effectively, effectively, the world is too complicated for that. We need very, very focused questions. And we need technologies which will allow us to address those questions very cost efficiently. And because the questions are so complex, there will be increasing interdependence across disciplines. It's no longer good enough for the neurologist to have an answer. You need the neurologist and the old age psychiatrist. You need the neurologist, the old age psychiatrist, and the old age geriatrician. And I'm just speaking about dementia. You will have your own networks of excellence and your own networks of expertise, which you will bring together. This is an inevitable trend. So to embrace it puts you ahead of the curve. Secondly, there will be increasing downward cost pressures. So we will need more efficient solutions. We live in an age of austerity. And in one sense, when you're going for grant funding these days, to actually come out with the same level of grant award that you, kept, you came out with the last time can be taken as a win, an absolute win. So there will be more rapid knowledge sharing. You know, the, the idea of having data which is mine um, is, 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 is so yesterday, all right. Ever since the big studies have come out, all the smaller studies have effectively been demonetized. The intrinsic value of their data is less than it would, up, would otherwise have been. But you can, if you like, revalue that data by making it accessible and by sharing it. And that is uh, something which many, many scientists are very, very slow uh, to adopt. And it will also involve increasing risk sharing. So if you go to a funder and say, here we have this very high risk um, question, it might be very high reward, but it's a high risk, they, they, they will sit back and think about it, yes? If you go to three funders and say, why don't we collectively share this risk? 
they're far more amenable to have less of a risk to bear with the potential <coughs> of sharing in just as great a win. So the idea of designing your research programs to share the risk, and not just with bona fide research funders, but with industry and with other stakeholder groups, is absolutely central. And then there is increasing social capital. So what we'd like to create is an opportunity-based culture, where you're, you're creating opportunity for people to do what they enjoy doing. Now that isn't actually too difficult when you think about it. And that also moves down to, if you like, a distributed trust-based management system. If you're dealing with very complicated research problems, the, 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 the command and control model does not bring out the best the most, of the most creative individuals. You need to give people the freedom to operate. You need to give them an environment in which they, they feel that they are empowered to enjoy what they're doing, to make the very best decisions, to, if you like, do what they can to be fulfilled in their jobs. And that way, you attract people to your research environment. That way, people want to work in ME. And you want an increasingly differentiated economy. So let's just think about it. You're a young researcher, early career researcher, and you join a very famous lab, and what happens, you, you have to learn your stock in trade. I did it as an epidemiologist. I did the shoe leather epidemiology, knocking on you know, the doors of 2,500 men in Caerphilly. Yes, I've been there. I've done it. You have to do it. And I could tell you some wonderful stories about that, but it would probably get me arrested. <laughs> OK, but, but the point is, if that's all that you're offering your young researchers, then you won't attract the best minds. And you need the best minds. So what you'd like is an economy where it's not just the first author in a paper, and it's not just the last author that gets the reward. What you'd like to do is to share the reward, share the academic attribution amongst everybody who's contributed to this important piece of science. Now, the current scientific economy doesn't allow that. It's very difficult. But we need to find ways of, of rewarding everybody who's involved so that for their particular career track, they can go out and say, yes, I'm a statistician. I did this, and these are my papers where I am, the statistician. Okay? I'm an imaging technician. And for all of these papers, I was the imaging technician. Now, if you look at current academic attribution in any journal you like, you will not find that. And all these people are frankly being disenfranchised for the heavy work, the heavy lifting they have done on behalf of the senior scientists. It has to change. It really has to change. So that's the environment which we're, we're, we're moving into. Um, so that's the scientific challenge. Let's talk about the experimental medicine challenge. It's all very well collecting loads and loads of data, but what you really want to do is to be able to ask the hard questions in order to develop actual and new interventions. Now, I'm what, what I'm going to do now is show you uh, an example from dementia. Here we have, if you like, an illustrative curve of, <coughs> of cognitive change. Here we have an inflection point where people are going from normal aging through to uh, dementia. Now, currently, we do trials in this space here where you have the red line. That's where the trials are done, and that's where the trials fail. And one of the reasons they fail is that actually by... Oops, sorry... By this stage, frankly, the brain is pretty well mashed. Okay? Even if you had the wonder treatment, there's not much left to restore. However, to do trials in this space, you've got two problems. Number one, you'll notice the slope is less steep. And that makes it harder to detect change. Number two, the people in this space, and it's probably I'm one of them, okay, don't think there's anything wrong. And if I came up to you and I said, oh, you know, would you like to help dementia research and take part in this trial? And you said, yes. And what's the trial about? Well, we're taking people who've got early stage dementia. What? <laughs> You've ruined their whole day. Okay? So we currently do not have ways of doing these sorts of studies. But let's be honest. This is exactly the sort of study that you want to be done. Because you want to have a treatment which, which gets in here with all of this cognitive capacity retained rather than a treatment which only works here when there isn't much left to keep. So 
there is, it's a no, pardon me, it's a no-brainer, okay? This is what we want to achieve. Everybody wants to, to achieve this, but we do not have a way of doing it. And that we must change. That is the scientific challenge. And if that is the scientific challenge for dementia, it's the scientific challenge in every area where you want to develop new treatments. How do we recruit the people, at the, the right people, at the right time in their disease? How can we do this? So there we are. That's, what, that's the challenge, and it's a very difficult one. Let's do another one now. Here's, here's one of the great paradoxes of, of medical research. It's called the Precision Medicine Challenge. The idea is that you want a treatment which actually works in a person. You don't want to be prescribing treatments and it only works in 30% of people. You want, you want to say, we don't want to waste the money on the 70%. The, the, if only we knew who they were, we would know that it's not going to work in them. We want to do it in the 30% where we know it's going to be effective. Okay, that's obviously great, but in order to do that, we need to have very precise data. So here we have data uh, from 5,000 people. We, do you think that's quite a large number, 5,000? Not too bad, not too bad. So, so um, uh, yeah, that, that, that's not bad, that's not bad, 5,000. And what we're going to look at here is blood pressure and risk of heart disease, okay? Now, so what we have here is all these different lines are looking at the blood pressure and risk of heart disease in different age groups. Okay. And as you can see that, it's very hard, even with 5,000 people, to actually work out if anything is going on whatsoever. So let's increase this number by an order of magnitude. Let's go up to 50,000 people. Okay, now we're now looking at 50,000 people, same data. Okay, and actually the beauty of this is this is a random sample of this. All right, So they're the same people. They're the same people. If you look at this now, oh, well, it's a bit more clear. And you can see that the people in different age groups, they do have different risk levels. The slope is, you know, is different according to um, uh, age. And there may be a sort of, a, 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 if you like, a bottoming out here and then an increase there. Um, but anyway, you'd be hard pressed to really think that, um, that you're going to base the rest of your life on that sort of data. OK, so let's go up an order of magnitude. Let's go to 500,000 people. All right. Number one, there is no uh, J shape, it's just a straight line. Of course, what we don't have in the West are very low blood pressure, so we don't know what happens uh, when up below uh, the 120 mark. But nevertheless, we have straight lines, and you can see that the blood pressure risk is true for all age groups, that increased blood pressure brings increased risk of heart disease. Okay, but here's the nice thing about this. You never have to do that again. <coughs> result, answer, definitive, okay, progress, move on. I think that's really impressive. But in order to do that, you've had to measure 500,000 people, okay? But it's much better measuring 500,000, getting your answer, and never having to do it again, the measuring 50,000, not getting quite the right answer, measuring another 50,000, and you do that 500 times because everybody does it all around the world in a different sort of idiosyncratic way, and you're never closer to the answer. So we need large studies to have precision medicine. Okay, let's look at another challenge. This is the cultural challenge. So I'm the director of Dementia's Platform UK, and um, these are the cohorts that we have in our, in our platform. It's a fantastic collaboration, absolutely fantastic collaboration. But all of, these, all of these cohorts said three years ago, we want to share our data. We really do want to do this. And I said, oh, wonderful, wonderful. So then I went down and tried to make it happen. All right. And what's happened is that for various reasons, and it's not just the fact that it's not just any one factor, it includes a whole load of, of, of of uh, university issues, legal issues, but it has taken um, two to three years to get just, I'd say, one and a half million people on our books. Two to three years. And you see this group here awaiting uh, data deposit agreement signatures. Some of those cohorts individually have taken over a year to sign. Because we do not have this culture of turning these things around rapidly. 
Okay, that has to change. That has to change. There is no good argument, and, I, and I'm really pleased to, to ask you the question, because I ask this wherever I go, all right? Is there a good reason for not sharing your data? No one comes up with a good reason. There are plenty of uh, professional reasons, of course, but actually there are no good reasons. Okay. So what we need is to, to be developing a sense, a greater sense of intellectual generosity, a greater sense of collaborating for the common good, a greater sense of sharing knowledge to accelerate progress and accelerate new treatments, um, uh, the, you know, going not just from the clever idea, but actually uh, to a, a product which is on the market. So, let's reimagine science for a bit, okay? Let's just reimagine. What could it be like? Well, what we could do is we could do something called platform science. And we're not measuring it in terms of mushrooms, i.e., here we have a project. We're measuring it in terms of yeast. Here we have a changed environment. Here we have something which is fertilizing, to mix all my metaphors, okay? Studies and opportunities and scientists and cultures. Wherever they go, we can, we can if you like, we can yeast things. And we want to change the culture to have more diffuse power. We want to enlarge the academic pre-competitive space. We want to consider data as a public good, public-funded public data. We want to consider them as a public good. There is no good reason for having it just on my server. Let's just put it out there for everybody to use. And that's not to say that there aren't very important, strict controls over access. These are sensitive data. I accept all of that. But nevertheless, let's find a way so that all these data, which we have paid for as taxpayers, by the way, are actually out there for scientists to use. And let's, ha let's acknowledge the value of people. You see, data is only as good as the people who are analyzing it. Data are only as good as the people who generously gave their time for it to be collected. Data is only as good as, frankly, industry can get hold of it to turn it into treatments. So let's value all of these stakeholders. Let's value all of these people. And because they are valuable, Let's use these data and exploit these data as wisely as possible. So let's have an environment change where you're effectively reducing congestion. So uh, if you like, the, the UK cohort um, environment, through necessity, and it's, a, it's probably one of the best in the world, so you mustn't think I'm knocking this, but effectively it's a collection of cottage industries. All right? No, seriously. What happened is, you know, a, a very clever scientist went to the MRC and twisted their arm to get some money, and the MRC said, no, okay then, go and do it. And the, and the scientist went and did it, and, and this scientist and uh, his or her team had to work out, well, how are we going to collect the data, and how are we going to store it, and, um, and how are we going to give people access to it, and how are we going to keep it secure, and how are we going to store the biosamples? Um, and how are we going to stop the labels falling off our, our biosamples in a minus 80 freezer? Because when we built, did all this, the labels weren't designed for minus 80 environments. Well, trust me, I've seen it, right? I, I've been to a freezer and I pulled out a bag, highly valuable, 30 year old blood samples stored at minus 80. And when you open the bag, the labels drop off. <laughs> it, it's terrible. <laughs> oh, you cry! You, know, you, you cry! But that's what happens. Okay. So we had this cottage industry idea. And what it needs to be done is frankly just replaced, replaced with cost-effective, centralized, efficient storage systems where we know what we're doing. We have the best people with the best practice doing it as cheaply as they possibly can. So that centralized data collection tool. So here's another one. So what you have is that oh, we need to measure diet. Let's measure some diet. So you go measure your diet. It's fantastic. The next study comes up. Let's measure diet. They do it differently. Oh, it's fantastic. Until you want to put them two together, of course. Oh, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm very sorry about that. We're moving house and. No, I think it's just you were talking about diet and your wife. Was oh right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, anyway, there we are. Anyway, so moving on, moving on quickly. So the point is you have two ways of collecting dietary data. They're both wonderful, they're just mutually incompatible. 
you know, it, it, it's, uh, and of course, I must, I must design and validate my diet questionnaire, and, and the other person does their diet questionnaire, and so you're spending, you're replicating and duplicating all this effort. And to, although it was necessary 30 years ago, it is wholly unnecessary now. Wholly unnecessary now. Okay. And we could do the same with, with data curation, and we could do the same with data access technologies. I love this data access business. So you go to a cohort and you say, we'd like to access your data. Fantastic. Here's our process. And you have to fill in 12 boxes. And that's fine. You go to another cohort, we'd like to access your data. Oh, wonderful. We're so pleased you've asked. Here's our process. Eight boxes. Now, these eight boxes aren't a subset of the 12 boxes, right? They cover the same material in a completely different way. And so you're, you're doing two sets of forms. And when you want to access 30 cohorts, 30 sets of forms. And what you could really do is go through all of those 30 <laughs> forms and say, hmm, they want to know about security. They want to know about uh, uh, if you, um, uh, intellectual property. Uh, they want to know about um, a robustness of the science. Those are the three points. Why don't we put all of those three points into three boxes? Mm -hmm. And then everybody can use them. Hadn't thought of that, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's the sort of thing we need to do. Right? And it's just not rocket science. It's the obvious thing to do. Okay, standardized recruitment and consent tools. Well, um, I remember going to an ethics committee, which shall remain absolutely nameless, and it will remain nameless as well, okay? And I wanted to uh, um, uh, email a whole lot of middle-aged people, sorry, write to a whole lot of middle-aged people and I wanted to ask them to log on to a website, answer some questionnaires, uh, be willing to um, uh, receive a, a blood lancet, donate some blood for genotyping, and give me permission <laughs> to link their results to their health records. Okay? Well, I had to go three times to get all this permission. They said no first time, I go back, complain. All right, we'll give you that bit, we're not having the rest of it. I go back and complain. Okay, we'll give you it, all right? Now, not every ethics committee would have given me a permission for that. They really wouldn't have done, okay? And then it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit like a, a postcode lottery. Which ethics committee am I gonna to go to for this, that, and the other? And it really should not be like that. There's a fantastic story of, of, uh, of Archie Cochran, this is an old man of epidemiology. Uh, and he, uh, he wanted to do a trial for heart disease uh, where the doctor would turn up. Uh, in those days, the doctor or the GP would go out to the, the, the victim on the street and, um, and send him off to a coronary care unit. And Archie didn't really believe that the coronary care units worked. So what he did was propose a study where some of them got sent to a coronary care unit and at random, somebody would get sent home for normal care, for normal treatment. And what would happen, the doctor would get there, he'd get out an envelope, right, and whatever he pulled out, coronary care or home, that's what the patient would get. Anyway, this was outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. How could you possibly do this? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, so it wasn't ethical in one part of the world. It was very ethical in another part of the world. Okay, so they did it in another part of the world. And they presented the results. Uh, and um, and uh, Archie, he, he is ruled mis mischievous uh, old man at that time. He said, here are some preliminary results. And in these preliminary results, the, the home care group had a worse outcome, i.e. there were more fatalities in the home care group than in the coronary care group. And, and the, the people listened and said, this is terrible. Shut down this trial. Everybody should go to the coronary care unit. <coughs> and Archie said, oh, so sorry. I got the numbers the wrong way round. Shall we close your coronary care unit? <laughs> there you are. There you are. And you can go and find that, the, the full results of that in the BMJ. Um, I won't tell you when and where. Okay. So we really need standard recruitment and consent tools so that we're doing these things in a standard, simplified way. Um, and governance for access, etc., etc. An incentive change. So I, what I quite like the idea of when you see a paper, it's not at the beginning you get the authors, but at the end, you get all the film credits. Wouldn't that be fantastic? All the credits. All the, I think that would be most wonderful. I would love to reimagine science doing that way. And my time is flying. Okay. 
So let's talk about next generation cohorts. Cohorts are fantastic things. Effectively what we do is, is we recruit people and we follow them over time and that gives us the best source of information on how a whole load of risk factors, lifestyle things affect a whole load of outcomes. It's the best information we, we could possibly have. So what we need to do is divide up how we're going to do our cohorts. So for example, UK Biobank is very, 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 very uh, intense and large, 500,000 individuals, but it's not very representative. They are volunteers. Okay? So if you want to know about what the incidence of a disease is, don't go to Biobank. If you want to know what the prevalence of a disease is, don't go to Biobank in the population. But if you want to know what the cause of a disease is, go to Biobank. So you've got to be very careful what you're doing. Okay? So we have very defined research questions. Platform-based, I've already argued that. Technology-led, I've already argued that. And, in, and this is the best one, infrastructure embedded. So why do we do a cohort? By setting up a clinic, no disrespect to my clinical colleagues here, okay? Hiring an enormously expensive um, uh, consultant to ask a patient their name, you know, their address, take their blood pressure, or whatever it might be, okay? Why not say to someone, um, uh, you're in school. What I'd like to do is an adolescent mental health cohort where we recruit in the schools, we use a teacher or in a classroom situation to do our first measurements. And then we use devices like these things just to talk to the teenagers at periodic times saying, how are you feeling? Show us your mood, bang. How, how, how fast is your reaction time? Let's see how you can do it, bang. And once you've got the system set up, the unit cost per 100,000 people you recruit is negligible. Completely different way of thinking about it. And it all started because you've embedded your, your cohort within existing social infrastructure. You slash costs by an order of magnitude. And the larger you think, the greater the savings. Why not do that? Okay, I'm, I don't have enough time to go. I would love to show you how, how all of this works. So that, that's, that's another pretty picture you're not going to see the detail of. Uh, th this, this proves um, that you can measure in, uh, in a clinic and you can measure at a home and you get the same results. This, this shows that you can do it at scale. So these are measurements on 500,000 people from UK Biobank. So we can do it at home, we can do it in a clinic, we can do it at scale. These new methods of operating are completely feasible. And now I'm going to talk very briefly about the Dementias Platform UK. Because this is where we've begun to implement what I've been talking about. Okay? So our mission is to use these cohorts to accelerate the development of new treatments for dementia. We're identifying all of these cohorts. We have over 40 at the moment. For, for many countries around the world, we have, uh, we're talking with cohorts in Hong Kong, um, uh, France. We have one or two in the US, uh, as well as plenty in the UK. Uh, and we want, but we want to use the information gathered over all these years to, to uh, tell us about how to get new treatments. But we need to work as a platform, not as individual researchers. So we have some core values. We are an intellectually generous community. We are committed to sharing data, best practice, and technologies. We are a creative community. We want to harness new ideas and new technologies and new ways of working. And we want to be a collaborative community, inviting all the stakeholders to join our programs and shape our activities. And by being explicit about our ethos, we can encourage people to come and join us. And it works. I know of no other collaboration in the world where principal investigators are willing to donate their data to an open platform. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a work in progress. You've seen the challenges we have in achieving it, but it is happening. It is happening. And it's happening because as a platform, we have earned the trust of the science community. And it's all about earning the trust of the people that you value and want to work with. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're making good science easier. So here's DPUK. We're developing tools so that the cohorts can, uh, if you like, collect more data. We're developing tools so that analysts can access and, and play with the data more easily. And we're developing tools for experimental medicine. 
And that principally boils down to, to helping trialists recruit the right people for the right trial at the right time in the disease stage. And that is very, very difficult. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that shortly. We, did, we had various research programs and we are building capacity. But what we're, capacity, what we're really doing though is building community. What we want is scientists who have common interests, you know, shared interests to come together. So what we do as the Dementia Platform is pay for their meetings. So here's the, here's the deal. Um, I will pay for any group of scientists focusing on dementia to meet for three times in a year. All right? All, everything's paid for. But there's no such thing quite as a free meal. Because I do pay for lunch as well. Okay? What they have to do is at the end of that year submit a substantial strategic grant. And by that, I'm meaning the order of in an excess of a million pounds. All right? Now let's just say half of those grants are successful and we have a hit rate of more than half, success rate of more than half. Was that a good return on the investment? Yeah. Yes. See, the meeting cost me £2,000 a shot. Okay? So I spent £6,000, generated all this scientific activity and the research group and the grant goes to the research group, not the Dementia's platform, so they get all the credit the research group has got a million pounds grants. They love it. I love it. Okay? But most of all, dementia research is benefited because the dementia research now has a million pounds that it would not otherwise have had. And this is the way I think, with respect, you guys should be thinking. How can we leverage highly competitive grants to get money out of the researchers, research funders? All right? Absolutely sensible thing to do. Okay, so we do three things effectively, rapid data access, highly characterized participants and developing core technologies. I'm only going to talk about one because I think it's, it's, it's those, are, those are various. Um. Okay, so this is risk stratification of clinical studies. Wouldn't it be nice, to, and this is my, virtually my final slide, wouldn't it be nice to know that I could do a trial in people who were at high risk, okay, I could contact them easily, and that they would be willing to come and help me. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So this is, this is what we're working towards. We're not quite there yet, but this is what we're working towards. Here is the UK Biobank population, 500,000 people, of which nearly 500,000 have a memory score. Okay? And, 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 and you can just show the distribution of the scores. Um, from this memory score, I can find out how many have a score of, of which is l two standard deviations below the mean, i.e. these are poor scorers, right? These folk have an issue with their memory. And out of all these hundreds of thousands, 17,000 have really low memory scores. Okay, I want to know how much of them are old, i.e. at risk of dementia. 12,000, 12 and a half thousand. But what I really want to know is how many are genetically at risk. Because these are the people that the treatments will benefit most. All right? Now, if I assume a carrier, an allele frequency of 20% because the data aren't released yet, I come out with 2,500 individuals. Okay? That took me five minutes. I sat at my computer, I got the database up, I said, <laughs> memory score, junk. Okay, two, what's, the, what's the standard deviation? Okay, less than this value, junk. Above, this age, above the age of 55, chunk, APOE positive, chunk. Five minutes. Now, that is extraordinary. But that is the level of efficiency which we have at our fingertips if we just got our act together. Okay? So that's what we're aiming for. These are the things that we're aiming for. So, uh, these are, we, we do many things in the Dementia's platform, but really I want to finish by saying that uh, it's a public-private partnership because we want to engage... See, academics are great at, at a new idea. Once they've had the new idea, they want the next new idea. Once you publish your paper in Nature, you want to publish another paper. The last thing you're going to do is spend the rest of your life developing a treatment. But industry would do it for you. Okay? So to have this relationship where you are genuinely working as partners which also means you can, if you like, influence the business model, actually, 
Now, we are generally working as partners is really the only way forward. So, I don't believe life is a script, okay? I believe it's a chess game. And we play chess to create opportunities, to face challenges. And as you sit there thinking, mm, where does ME go from here? I really want to, to just challenge you, right? What are the opportunities that you can create? And what are the challenges that you can address and solve um, as this very, very excellent group? Thank you.